Okay, everybody, thanks for uh, uh, joining today. So i um, got a very special guest, uh, Dr. Kavita Sharma is joining us from Johns Hopkins University. And um, I want to read a little bit about why we invited her to uh, speak with us today um, and the, the paper she's going to share with us. So um, the, the um, circulation family of journals selects best papers um, that have been published within their journals. They've been doing this for the past few years, uh, past three years. And they say that, you know, they look to, to highlight the best articles published in circulation each year focusing on two broad categories. One is clinical population science, and the second is basic translational science. And they did this to uh, recognize outstanding articles and also to bestow recognition on the investigative teams, as well as to honor two legendary leaders in cardiovascular medicine who are former editors in chief, editors in chief of the journal. So uh, for the uh, year of 2021, the award for best basic translational article, which is named after Dr. Joseph Loscalzo, um, uh, was awarded to Dr. Sharma and her group. Uh, Dr. Loscalzo uh, was a former editor in chief of circulation and uh, eventually led the launch of seven subspecialty journals within the circulation family. Um, he is the Hersey Professor of Theory and Practice of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chair of the Department of Medicine and Physician in Chief at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, so this year's award, as I mentioned, goes to Dr. Uh, Kavita Sharma and her colleagues, Dr. Virginia Hahn and Dr. Hilder uh, Nutz-Doder, if I pronounced that one right, um, for an article titled Myocardial Gene Expression Signatures in uh, Human Heart Failure with Preserved Ejection Fraction. Um, so the group reported uh, myocardial RNA sequencing data from 41 patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, 30 heart, with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and 24 control subjects, and used the analyses uh, to um, perform uh, analyses of these biological specimens until principal component analyses and hierarchical clustering, as well as weighted gene co-expression analyses to identify half path transcriptomic clusters. I'm sure she'll teach us what that means. Um, their findings uncovered patterns of gene expression and half path myocardium largely distinct from those in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And the, uh, from what I can gauge is, as you all know, there's, there's really a lack of treatment uh, options out there for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And, and the hope is that her work might be a uh, step in understanding what types of treatments might eventually be able to be developed for this group of patients. Um, so Dr. Sharma is the Associate Professor of Medicine and the Chief of Heart Failure and Transplant Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins University and the Director of the Johns Hopkins University Heart Failure with Preserved Ejection Fraction Program. Her clinical expertise is in the diagnosis and management of patients with cardiomyopathies involving left and right heart disease and the treatment of advanced heart failure, including heart transplantation and mechanical circulatory support, as well as the diagnosis and management of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Her research area of interest is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, specifically clinical and molecular phenotyping of HEFPEF, understanding pathophysiological mechanisms of the disease, and identifying therapeutic targets. She is a PI of many ongoing clinical trials in HEFPEF and is the U.S. national leader of the Paraglide, Fine Arts, Step HEFPEF, Step HEFPEF DM trials uh, that are currently ongoing. Um, she's received funding support for her research from the American Heart Association and from Amgen. So Dr. Sharma, thank you so much for again, taking the time. Really excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Michael, that was such a warm, um, amazing welcome. And I feel like you could probably explain this paper and all the findings just as well as I could. And maybe I should hand this over to you. but. Uh, but that was incredibly warm and it's very exciting to be here. I see uh, familiar names. Uh, it looks like most everyone is off camera, but hopefully throughout the talk, you guys will pop up on camera and we can have a discussion at the end. But um, uh, it's really great to be here. I know the focus and what I was asked to kind of speak to you all about was this paper that was published in circulation from our group last year, but I wanted to put this in context um, with some of the 
studies we had done prior to this in HEFPEF and just kind of the overall HEFPEF landscape. So for the clinicians, hopefully that'll be of interest to you. Uh, for those who are more basic translational, you'll probably won't be more interested in the, in the paper findings themselves. So, and at the end, I actually included some information about the latest with the treatment in HEFPEF. So if there are clinical minded folks on the call who, you know, are interested in more discussion there, I'm happy to, or we could kind of pause and, and talk about the paper in more detail. So let me share my screen now and we can get going here. All right. Uh, okay, hopefully you see the first slide. Okay, great, excellent. Um, here are my disclosures and much of the work I will be presenting was supported by an American Heart Association SFRN network grant um, that I received um, as an early faculty member at Hopkins with a large collaborating team. Um, and you'll see some of that work presented today. So I uh, thought about sort of overview, providing an overview of the evolving demographics and HEFPEF, um, some of the challenges to phenotyping and really what led um, me and collaborators at Hopkins to, to really pursue um, tissue-based phenotyping and, and deeper understanding of mechanisms of disease and HEFPEF. And then at the, end, at the end, we can close out with some updates and treatments because this is an exciting area right now in the field. So this is no surprise uh, to most of you, especially those of you who are in uh, clinical uh, care of heart failure patients that there are approximately six and a half million with heart failure in the United States. This number has probably even um, gone up since this was published in 2020. HEFPEF accounts for approximately 50% of all heart failure cases. So we're talking about over 3 million patients. The prevalence of HEFPEF relative to HEFREF does seem to be rising. Um, and this is now a paper that it predicted that by 2020, which of course were past that half, half would surpass half ref in the hospitals, they seem to be still about equivalent, but by 2030, certainly preserved EF is more likely to be the population we see. And that's including all wards. So medicine wards, cardiology, um, and, uh, and other you know, hospitalist type wards, not just cardiology services. So HEFPEF still constitutes a major unmet need. Uh, the one-year mortality post-hospitalization can be upwards of 30%, five-year survival at 50% if hospitalized. We still have limited therapies with any benefit, though um, a couple of therapies that are promising and have shown great um, you know, likely benefit from the last uh, year. Uh, there's a global sense that we still have a need to probably better phenotype HEFPEF patients. It's still a very um, heterogeneous population, um, but I think the pendulum is actually starting to uh, swing back towards finding more uh, consistent um, uh, uniform mechanisms that are underlying some of the disease pathophysiology. Um, globally, though, we have a limited understanding of disease mechanisms. Animal models have been very challenging to develop historically um, because you're looking at having multiple comorbidities in one single model, and it's very hard to replicate that. And on top of that, add in a congestive um, heart failure physiology profile to the model. Um, there has been a call for targeted precision-based therapies and translating that to clinical trial design, and there's always been a gap between what has been identified as uh, perhaps therapeutic targets or precision-based approaches to therapies, and then how do you translate that in reality to identifying the right patient subtype to target in clinical trials? So just as a historical perspective, you know, HEFPEF in the 1980s looked very different than what HEFPEF does look like today. Um, certainly, this is a paper actually written by Eric Topol, Tom Trail, and Nick Fortu, and when they were all at Hopkins in 1985, it was published in the New England Journal. 21 patients were described who presented to the emergency department with significant profound dyspnea on exertion, very acute onset, severe orthopnea. Um, all, nearly all were women. They were elderly. They were of normal or low BMI um, with significant LVH, but not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this was that classic little old lady syndrome that we used to hear about and learn about in medical school and even on the wards as residents. But this has really changed over the last 20 to 30 years. HEFPEF today looks very different. And this is a nice uh, schematic from Sanjeev Shah from Northwestern showing really chronologically here exactly what we're seeing in practice, which is that we're moving away from this significantly hypertrophied small um, left ventricular volume, um, uh, filling volume, you know, type picture with very, very steep filling pressures to a multi-morbidity profile patient um, who likely has metabolic syndrome, uh, and then a combination of sedentary lifestyle, metabolic stress, aging, ventricular vascular stiffening to still a certain extent, 
all in combination leading to loss of um, multi-system reserves, so cardiac, vascular, and skeletal muscle. And this is really what we see predominantly in clinic today. And why is that? Well, um, it's probably related to what's happening at the population level and the comorbidity. So with obesity and diabetes on the rise, we're seeing that this is the predominant phenotype in HEFPEF as opposed to those with ischemic heart disease or primarily hypertensive heart disease. So when you look at phenotyping in HEFPEF, there have been many ways um, that have been described to do this predominantly by comorbidities or maybe by clinical presentation. Is a patient congested or more short of breath? Do they have AFib or chronotropic incompetence? Um, there have been hemodynamic studies to try to phenotype these patients, um, biomarker related studies. And then of course, taking a machine learning approach where you take sort of all of these different methodologies, put them into an, an AI algorithm or a machine learning algorithm and try to identify agnostically subgroups, which has been done by a couple of groups. Um, the least, though, has really been done by directly assaying uh, biologic tissues, so, you know, from human subjects especially, and, and that's where our interest came in, is to really probe the myocardial tissue. So in our clinic, um, we actually give every patient who comes into clinic, before we get into tissue phenotyping or anything else, a clinical phenotype, and that's based on their predominant profile of comorbidities that are driving the syndrome. But you can imagine, as clinicians yourselves, this gets very messy. There's so much overlap between many of those, these phenotypes here. The hypertensive heart patient is likely going to have cardiometabolic features to them in 2022, as opposed to in 1985. So this often ends up overlapping quite a bit, but nevertheless, we do this so we can, you know, look at within our cohort at some of the outcomes. So Sanjeev Shah was one of the first to describe um, what he called phenomapping of HEFPEF. Um, he looked at essentially the Northwestern cohort there, so around just shy of 400 patients. They looked at clinical parameters, laboratory findings, ECG, echocardiography, and um, essentially performed um, hierarchical clustering analysis within this group to identify subgroups and then look to see whether there were differences in outcomes and in characteristics. And what they found were that there were three predominant subgroups that were identified or distinguished by these clinical metrics. Uh, one was a younger profile patient group, um, and that was phenogroup one. And on the survival curves here for, um, so survival free of cardiovascular hospitalization or death, these, this group had the best outcomes. And there was this third group that was older patients with CKD, significant electrical and myocardial remodeling, pulmonary hypertension, and RV dysfunction that had by far the worst outcomes. And you can see the survival at 40 months are really dismal. I mean, this is on the order of advanced hef ref, if you will. And we don't transplant these patients often or, or and certainly don't have great uh, mechanical support options for them. So really to highlight that there is a subgroup population that is quite sick um, in, this, uh, in this disease. Um, now, another study from David Keo uh, from Colorado looked at phenotyping from clinical trials. So, um, so this group essentially looked at um, characterizing HEFPEF into subgroups from the iPreserve and the CHARM Preserve study. So these are older HEFPEF trials, and you could argue that the patients enrolled at that time were not necessarily representative of who we see in HEFPEF today, uh, but nevertheless, a similar idea. And so here, the groups pre-specified 11 clinical characteristics and then essentially performed latent class analysis to try to identify subgroups. Um, and the characteristics are described uh, in the paper itself, I didn't list them all here, uh, but essentially six subgroups were identified. Um, and the two subgroups with the worst event theory survival in both studies of both of those trials were characterized by a high prevalence of obesity, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, anemia, renal insufficiency. So you get the sense that they have a lot of comorbidities. Um, and in these two groups, actually a female predominance and advanced age with relatively lower BMI. Um, and so those are shown here in the orange and the purple, and those are the, the key characteristics from that study. Now, how do you translate this to treatment? Well, there's really kind of the holy grail that everyone is trying to achieve in HEFPEF, and there's a, a, a big gap here. So you can phenotype and apply all kinds of fancy hierarchical clustering or different clustering methodologies, but at the end of the day, how do you then translate that to treatment trials? And I don't know that anyone's really figured that part out yet. Uh, Sanjeev and Walter Paulus a couple of years ago proposed this, um, I think, practical algorithm of how to approach treatment based on 
the predisposing underlying comorbidities, which are in the vertical column on the, on the left, and then the clinical presentation. So is it pulmonary congestion? Is it chronotropic incompetence? And then having sort of a practical, um, user-friendly way to approach treatment. I won't go through the whole thing, but this was the first stab at taking presentation and clinical comorbidities and, and trying to target therapies. Now, just as a bit of background, um, I founded the HEFPA program at Hopkins in 2015, and this really came about because I was so struck with the burden of this syndrome on the wards as a chief resident in internal medicine and as a cardiology fellow. So I started seeing these patients in a dedicated clinic as a fellow, um, had no idea where this would go, and here we are today. It's a weekly clinic now. We have over 450 patients that we follow. We have a dedicated nurse practitioner. We've just now hired a nurse to join the team. Um, we have four uh, research uh, coordinators that are part of the HEFPEF research uh, team. Um, every new patient coming in gets a, um, a very sort of systematic baseline assessment. We do six-minute walks, frailty assessment, quality of life assessments. Um, everyone gets a dedicated HEFPEF echocardiogram. You might ask what that is. It's just simply having very standardized diastology assessment as well as strain, which was not always the case in happening with all echoes obtained throughout the Hopkins system. Um, a rule out of coronary disease or a rule in. And then many patients are referred for hemodynamic testing to confirm the diagnosis. And now in the last two years, any patient coming to the cath lab, we do right heart catheterization with exercise. And that I think many groups believe is really the gold standard. And we have what is unique um, to our center is an IRB protocol for research into myocardial biopsy tissue. So patients can consent to this at the time of right heart catheterization. And we end up, have, we are now, you know, a referral center in the region and even nationally for clinical trials and translational research. So we have a lot of different arms of the program, but what I'm going to focus on today is really what's happening in the translational research arm. And that's where um, the work that we, we published last year really stems from. So our multi-omics approach to HEFPEF. Um, so to begin with, I wanted to just uh, present our paper that we published in Jack Hartfelder in 2020. Um, this was really the largest um, human myocardial tissue characterization of heart failure with preserved ejection fractions. So we looked at 108 patients who were referred to our clinical program, who underwent right heart catheterization and the biopsy protocol. And we simply looked at histology and we compared this to have REF, so we had dilated cardiomyopathy tissue from a tissue bank at the University of Pennsylvania. So these are explanted hearts uh, at the time of transplant. So remember, this is advanced end stage heart failure patients. Um, and compare that to controls and control tissue, you might wonder, where do you get control to human tissue from? Well, these are unused donor hearts that are also part of the same tissue bank at UPenn. So um, controls with the big asterisks because these are patients that are brain dead, normal cardiac function, we're coming up for donor organ, um, but we're not used for whatever reason. So there are obviously limitations there. We looked at fibrosis, inflammation, hypertrophy in the presence of infl inflammatory or infiltrative disease. Here's a snapshot of what our cohort looks like, and I would say it's fairly the same today compared to when we published the paper. So average age, mid 60s, female predominance, African-American predominance, and that's a reflection of our care of patients in the Baltimore area. Um, many had been hospitalized previously, all are symptomatic. Um, they're hypertensive, but not extremely so. So a, a median systolic blood pressure of 140, um, a mean BMI of around 37, and that's probably only gone up from, from where this was. Um, many with, most with hypertension, half with diabetes, relatively few with coronary disease. And I think this is, again, a reflection of where the HEFPEF phenotype is shifting, a third with AFib. And you can see here um, a, a median antiprobian P of around 450. So in spite of being a very obese cohort, um, we do have, you know, patients that do have elevated antiprobian Ps. They tend to be the sicker profile patients. And then many that are, you know, under 200 as well. Um, the echo and hemodynamic parameters are pretty classic for HEFPEF here. As you can see, um, the mean wedge pressure of 18, we use 15 at rest, 25 with exercises are cutoffs, it's fairly standard, um, and then relatively normal uh, cardiac output and cardiac uh, index. So just from a histopathologic standpoint, 
What we found was that um, almost all patients that we examined here had some degree of myocardial fibrosis. Um, but interestingly, the grading of this was not severe, um, but for a few patients in the cohort. Um, myocardial fibrosis has long been thought to be a major component of developing HEFPEF. This has been um, you know, reported by Mike Zile and others. Um, but in our prospective study, and these are patients not going to cabbage or some other, or AVR or TAVR or other procedures, just patients coming into the clinic with signs and symptoms of heart failure meeting hemodynamic criteria, um, this was not that severe. Uh, similar for myocyte hypertrophy. So nearly all over 90% of patients have it, but it's not particularly severe. Um, we identified 14% of patients to have amyloidosis on biopsy, and more than half of those patients were not suspected clinically to have amyloidosis, uh, and a very small percentage with myocarditis that was incidentally found. We looked more carefully at quantifying fibrosis in the tissue and found that our non-amyloid HEFPEF patients had significantly more fibrosis than controls, um, but quite similar actually to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then we looked at inflammation and specifically CD68 positive staining cells. Um, these are usually macrophages um, and found that, you know, we had a higher number of, of positive staining cells in our non-amyloid HEFPEF, um, certainly more than controls, but also more than the other two subgroups as well. And this tended to correlate with older age and worse renal function uh, when we looked at clinical characteristics that predicted this. So for those who are interested about the amyloid cohort, I'll just spend uh, just a minute on this here um, because I think it's very interesting with all the treatments that are out there. We really can't miss this. It's a, it's a um, HEFPEF is a mimicker or vice versa. Um, the most common um, type found, not surprisingly, was ATTR amyloidosis. And within that wild type uh, TTR amyloidosis, we did have a few patients who were identified to have um, genetic mutation hereditary form, one patient who actually had two actually pathologic mutations. Um, the next most common and being light chain amyloidosis. Um, elevated NT pro BNP was a predictor of having amyloid on biopsy in our HEFPEF cohort, as well as elevated troponin. Um, so on the left here, you see the comparison of the two. These are log transformed. On the right, you see the ranges of troponin level, and that um, essentially non amyloid HEFPEF really should have no reason to have elevated troponin, and it, and it really doesn't, um, but amyloid will. So then segueing to our um, study from last year, um, this is our myocardial gene expression paper um, looking at RNA sequencing from human HEFPEF, again, comparing to HEFREF, same tissue bank from the University of Pennsylvania and controls, again, unused donor heart tissue. Um, this was led by Virginia Hahn, who is a fellow at Hopkins. She did her general cardiology advanced fellowship training um, and is now on the faculty in our group and is a first year faculty member. So she, we're very proud of the work she's done. And this was uh, supported by the American Heart Association. So we looked at 41 HEFPEF subjects and performed principal component analysis and hierarchical clustering after RNA sequencing was complete to see if we could identify subgroups within HEFPEF. Um, and I'll go through the data here and feel free to stop me as we go. So this is first a PCA um, a principal component analysis comparing HEFPEF to HEFREF and controls. So on the plot, which you see are individual dots or individual patients, and we're looking to see how much overlap or how um, distinct they are from each other. And we're looking at differential gene expression. So this is a plot comparing these three groups to each other and how do their gene expression profiles by RNA sequencing approximately 30,000 genes, how does it distinguish? And you can see that there is strong within group clustering of these three groups with really very little over, uh, overlap. This is our hierarchical clustering analysis. So without any input, as clinicians as to who is which, we look to see whether gene expression itself would, could differentiate these three groups. And you can see that the three clinical groups are, are up in the top, orange, green, and purple, and they really maintain strong within group clustering. This is purely determined by gene expression signatures with very little crossover between them. So there is one HEFREF patient that crossed over into the purple HEFPEF group you'll see, and five have PEFs that kind of, from a gene expression standpoint, subgrouped within HEF-REF, but for the most part, these actually remained quite distinct, which we were very surprised at because for a long time, HEF-PEF and HEF-REF were thought to be actually on a spectrum of the same disease. And maybe this is just different stages of one um, underlying pathophysiology or, or a common thread. 
So we then looked at differentially expressed genes between HEF-PEF and HEF-REF, so controls um, are coming out of this right now. It's a complicated, um, uh, colorful Venn diagram here, but um, essentially what it boils down to is that HEF-PEF upregulated genes are in the purple and the downregulated genes in HEF-PEF are in the magenta pink, yellow and red and the top and bottom are HEF-REF. And we're looking to see what is the overlap between upregulated genes in PEF and REF and downregulated. And while there's a fair bit of overlap, um, what you'll find is that nearly 3,800 genes are uniquely differentially expressed in HEF-PEF versus HEF-REF. So uh, in fact, many that are distinct uh, and far less overlap than we, we had predicted. So then we looked at um, gene expression changes in HEF-PEF versus control. And um, these are essentially plots of Z-scores. So what we did is we took 10 targeted pathways that we felt have either been postulated in the past to be relevant to HEF-PEF mechanisms, or we predicted might be relevant. And those included oxidative phosphorylation, um, uh, electron transfer chain, autophagy, fibrosis, cyclic GMP, oxidative stress. And so these are taking now um, numerous genes that are clustered into these pathways. And we look to see what is a differential gene expression within these pathways between HEF-PEF and HEF-REF? So each respective plot is within a pathway that has many, many genes included. The purple bars are PEF and the orange bars are REF. And you'll see there's a midline of unity here. And if you're towards the right of the midline, that's kind of overexpression of the genes. And if you're to the, towards the left, it's underexpression. And interestingly, we saw that in oxidative phosphorylation, for example, the upper um, plot on the left here, the purple bars are mostly positive. So upregulation of genes in the oxphos pathways for HEF-PEF, kind of neutral for HEF-REF. Um, surprisingly, if you go all the way across to fibrosis, which had been really thought to be, as I mentioned, a big player in HEF-PEF, we see that the majority of fibrosis-associated genes were downregulated in HEF-PEF, um, again, fairly neutral for HEF-REF. Um, so this was sort of a surprising in, in terms of what we thought for a long time. And our group, and David Cass in particular, had long thought that cyclic GMP and PKG signaling was a big uh, implicated pathway in HEF-PEF. Um, you know, mechanisms. But again, you can see here that really not significantly um, upregulated um, in HEF-PEF in, in, in at least this myocardial gene expression analysis. So some surprising findings here when we look to see what were the driving factors, but oxidative phosphorylation stood out uh, amongst these. We then did perform something called a GO pathway analysis. So this is again, a different strategy to really cluster genes into primary themes or pathways of our underlying mechanism and looking to see whether these gene pathways are up or down regulated in HEFPEF. So we focused in now on only pathways down regulated in HEFPEF. So that's what we're starting with in this plot. And um, the, the dots on the plot are essentially representative of each respective pathway. They're listed on the left. Um, the more red, the more statistically significant this is compared to controls, and the size of the dot reflects the gene ratio. So uh, the greater the number of genes that are, uh, that are essentially upregulated within that pathway. So these are really all significantly different. We then wanted to see if you look at the predominantly downregulated pathways in HEFPEF, in the whole cohort, and then adjusted for BMI, which we think is a is a major you know comorbidity uh, influencer in HEFPEF, and then adjusted for five covariates, so age, sex, diabetes, BMI, and renal function, do we lose or gain any um, um, significance in terms of these downregulated pathways? Does that actually affect or interact with what is um, downregulated? And what we saw is that adjusting for these covariates really made no difference in which pathways were downregulated. Um, to summarize, these are predominantly pathways implicated in autophagy, protein processing, angiogenesis, and no change by uh, adjusting for covariates. On the other hand, when we looked at um, you know, upregulated pathways in HEFPATH, so here, again, the opposite signaling, um, we found that they're the primary pathways, again, oxidative phosphorylation, electron transport chain, mitochondrial ATP synthesis, when we adjust for BMI, we pretty much lose all of those pathways in terms of their significance for being upregulated. So very much influenced by BMI. When we adjusted for those five covariates, we have all of those come out um, of, the, of the GO pathway analysis here. So really a strong interaction here with BMI and the other comorbidities I mentioned, not something that we saw with the downregulated pathways. <clears throat> 
So then within HFF, we wanted to see if we could identify subgroup, sub subgroups, I should say. Um, so we're now taking out the HEF-REF and the controls. These are only the 41 patients that we looked at within HEF-PEF. And we did something called non-negative matrix factorization or NMF analysis. It's again, a, in, in the simplistic, most simplistic terms, it's a different type of clustering analysis here. And we're looking to see whether gene expression within HEF-PEF alone can actually subdivide um, and, 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 and indicate distinct groups here. And you see that there are sort of three groups that were identified. The first two, and they're indicated by the colors around the top, so the teal and the magenta, have pretty tight within group clustering. They're fairly homogenous. You see the density of the coloration really signifying that this is a distinct group. And a third group that is actually quite heterogeneous, not like the other two. We looked at these in a, in a PCA analysis. So you've seen this kind of plot now, um, you know, earlier. So we're comparing now those three subtypes of HEF-PEF to HEF-REF. So on this plot, the orange triangles are HEF-REF. The teal, purple, and magenta are the three groups that we identified within HEF-PEF. And interestingly, there's that teal group that has a fair bit of overlap with HEF-REF. It almost seems from a trans transcriptional standpoint to be closer to HEF-REF even than its counterparts in HEF-PEF. The magenta and the purple groups so quite distinct. There's really no overlap with HEF-REF. So then we wanted to know who are these three groups? What characterizes these three groups? And, and are there in fact similarities between this teal group and say a, a dilated cardiomyopathy population? So we looked at the characteristics. So the numbers are relatively modest, but for a human tissue analysis study, you know, this is the first of its kind. And so it, 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 you take it for what it is, but you know, our, our hope is to, and we are, we are looking at higher numbers of a lot of this at this stage right now, but this is what we had at the time. In that first group, which is that group that was similar to HEF-REF, um, the majority were male. They had the highest LV mass indices, uh, certainly uh, the highest NT-proBNP levels, so 1500 median, um, and then higher PA systolic and PA mean pressures. So worse kind of pulmonary vascular remodeling, higher um, biomarker profile here, worse structural um, heart disease as you, can, as you can get the sense of. That second group was all women. Uh, they were relatively of the highest BMI of the group. They're not statistically significantly different because everyone is obese, but their median BMI was 43 um, and the lowest anti-pro BMP. So this is 48. This is that classic kind of very obese, low, low anti-pro BMP profile patient still has half pep but very different from the first group. This one also had to had a signal for slightly increased inflammatory cells in the myocardial tissue. Didn't end up being statistically significant because again, the numbers are quite low. Um, and then the third group was quite heterogeneous. So it didn't have any major distinguishing features compared to the first two, kind of a mix, um, if you will, of uh, the two in, in a you know, unique way. So in summary, we have group one, which is predominantly male, um, relatively lower BMI, higher filling pressure profile, higher pulmonary vascular load, higher anti pro BNP. Group two, all female, highest BMI, smaller LV size, lowest anti pro BNP with maybe an inflammatory profile. And group three was sort of a mixed picture. And we looked at their outcomes. So this is probability of event-free survival, so heart failure hospitalization or death. And we see here that that first group um, had significantly worse outcomes. So at um, just one year, they were looking at around a 35% um, you know, probability of event-free survival, which is really pretty bad. Um, and again, having a signal towards some of the outcomes we talk about in, in more advanced have ref heart failure, whereas the other two groups had outcomes that were, um, you know, substantially better than this first group. We went back to compare just these three groups in a, in a keg pathway analysis, um, just another uh, uh, method to look at enrichment within certain pathways um, via differential expressed genes expression. And you can see that there are distinct pathways that are characteristic of these groups. So for group one, for example, this is closest to half ref. Um, we see the pathways here more related to, um, so it's got a cytoskeleton, um, uh, MAP kinase signaling, cyclic AMP, even some hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genes coming in there. For the second group, more diabetes, maybe some viral myocarditis um, pathway um, genes implicated here. Group three, very, very different profiles. So this was very interesting and we're, we're looking further into this now. I do wanna mention that um, this within six months we had 
Uh, another paper publishes a letter in circulation. This was led by Imran Aslam, also a heart failure fellow um, who is now at UT Southwestern, looking at RV sarcomere contractility, again, from our myocardial tissue bank. Um, and so Imran and Steve Sue and Dave Cass and colleagues, um, you know, have a really nice and really neat uh, method by which they can measure active and passive sarcomere function. Um, and these are basically from single myocytes that are isolated in a skinning solution from the biopsy pieces. And the take home message here is that, you know, when you look at passive for sarcomere length curves, that's figure B, and when you look at active for sarcomere curves here, we, we find that if we take half path patients and subroute them into a, like a hypertensive phenotype and a metabolic phenotype, which is what we did, we actually predefined these two groups as two different phenotypes. Um, we found that the, you know, the myocytes were far stiffer um, in, this, uh, in, this, in this hypertensive phenotype group, um, but that the contractility though in the obesity metabolic syndrome group was really, really impaired significantly so um, in the obesity group compared to the hypertensive uh, phenotype group. So you see that on, in, on panel C here. Um, so these are again, half path patients, all symptomatic, all with hemodynamically uh, proven half PEF, um, but those with class two or greater obesity had substantially depressed RV systolic sarcomere function, less passive myocyte stiffening when compared to those with hypertensive phenotype. So that has a lot of implications for how we think about um, half PEF in general, but therapeutics. You know, we typically call this a disease of impaired diastology. It's a stiffness issue. We don't ever really talk about contractility and is that normal or not, though I think many of us suspect it's not likely the case, but it's clearly very impaired. Um, in the obese population. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, I'm happy to chat about where we are with treatments and a much more clinical scope, but I know the focus was this paper and I'm happy to pause to take questions. So Michael, I'll take your lead here. Yeah, um, well, thank you so much. It's, it's uh, really a, a wonderful talk so far. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions out there? If not, I do have a couple, but I'll um, give my, I'll defer to the rest of the group first. Um, uh, Dr. Tark Ahmad, who's our uh, director, uh, was on, uh, but he'd left a message in the checks. He had to jump off and um, he thanks you for coming and thinks the talk was okay. incredible as well. Yeah. Well, the questions, I had two questions and maybe you're gonna get into this with those next slides is that, you know, with the recent um, release of the updated heart failure guidelines, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like you know, and then there's this this talk now, like you know, out there in the community about, you know, is ejection fraction relevant anymore? Because you know the treatments are really starting to overlap so much. Where you've got, you know, your, um, you know, class two recommendations for, you know, SGLT two inhibitors and MRAs um, in your HEFPEF patients, and then even your RAS inhibition with Entresto, you know, up to certain ejection fractions as well. Um, but do you think that we're do you think that we're oversimplifying things, and especially I guess based upon what you just um, demonstrated with um, these uh, with the, that gene expression cluster figure, I think that you showed early on in the talk, really like how different these clinical syndromes might be on a molecular level, um, and are we are we just basically you think we're just throwing those drugs at our HFPF patients because that's what we have, um, or what's your thought? Yeah, I think that's um, that's a great series of questions, and I think that's uh, I think what, that's what everyone is sort of trying to figure out. Us in the clinical world, industry, and scientists, um, you know, I, I think from a clinical standpoint, I still consider half path more of a purist to be fifty percent ejection fraction or up. I'm not totally convinced that the sixty and higher group is truly a distinct group. Um, you know, the. the Clinical trials have suggested that those patients um, may have some differential response, or I should say, actually, you know, observational studies and cohort studies have shown that there's a significant U-shaped survival curve, and maybe those patients don't do very well, and they have, you know, higher numbers of outcomes, but that hasn't necessarily played out in the trials either. So there's some debate there as to what to do with that population. For now, we certainly include them within half path. I think the population that's really the most challenging and that we have the most to kind of learn about and figure out where to where to bucket them is the mid-range. The new guidelines have now identified that as a, as a distinct group. So they're not just sort of the stepchildren that no one wants to talk about. They have a name to them. It's heart failure with you know, um, middle mid-range ejection fraction, essentially. Um, I don't think it's a big surprise that most of the neurohormonal agents that have been looked at, whether that's MRA, ARNI, um, have 
probably shown a benefit in that group. And that what's happening now, as you can see, HEFPEF trials are now lowering the, the EF cutoff. And I think that's um, partly you know, strategic from a, from a clinical trial design standpoint. Now sitting on the steering committee for many of these, of these and wearing multiple hats, I can see how um, you know, if you see a couple of trials have a signal towards helping those in 40 to 50 range, you're gonna have those patients included to perhaps drive your events, to, to get more of that signal for benefit. Um, but I don't know that that population is truly hef To me, that could, that could to me, I think clinically, they seem to be more HEF-REF. I certainly personally treat them as aggressively as I can, as if they are HEF-REF if insurance companies will cover the, you know, the main GDMT therapies for that group. Um, I think that we still have to fully understand this. I do think SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonists, we're seeing a trend of using more metabolic pleiotropic, you know, therapies that have multi effects in a cardiometabolic profile patient now seeing a benefit in HEF-PEF and that probably fits the predominant phenotype that we're seeing in practice, which is far from that, you know, lean, very hypertensive single organ issue and single comorbidity issue patient. Um, so that's a long way to answer to your question, but I, I think that um, we are seeing distinct signals at the gene expression level, which I think just supports the idea of looking at these two entities differently. There's probably a mid-range EF that is headed towards half ref or um, either hemodynamically or from an underlying pathophysiology standpoint is, is behaving like half ref and we ought to probably look at them you know, more closely. We did not have EF as a distinguisher or something that came out to be different between those three groups we identified, but I think that might also be the fact that we cut things off at 50%. You didn't get into you know, our clinical cohort without having an EF of 50% or greater. Um, anyone else would like to ask a question? I, I do have others, but I'll wait to see if anybody else speaks up for a moment. I had two more basic questions. I, well, I think they're probably more basic questions, but just out of curiosity, when, you're, when you were describing your three groups of mm -hmm. uh, patients, uh, where would you put the obese diabetic male? Because um, it seems you've got the obese diabetic female and you've got yeah. the more hypertensive lower BMI male, um, but where, where do those people, do those people fall into group three? So or? I, I, I'm not totally convinced that they, that this sex difference signal is a real signal here. Remember the numbers in the groups are quite small. I think that, you know, if this was a very obese male with diabetes and low, low NT pro BNP, I think they're probably most likely to fit in group two. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the fact that they were all women does not necessarily mean that that's a sex associated signal. And when we actually did our RNA sequencing analysis simply by male and female, we did not find many um, distinguishing gene expression profiles between the two. We actually went into this entire AHA SFRN predicting that there would be major sex differences in HEFPEF, and that actually didn't play out in the, in the way and as strongly as we thought it would. And that's showing itself now in, in epidemiologically in terms of who we see in the clinic. It's almost a 50-50 split now. Okay, okay. I think I answered the third one for myself as I was just thinking about it. Um, but I was going to ask about, you know, obviously at places where don't, you know, the, the diagnostic techniques might be more limited than what you have um, at Hopkins. What simple echo parameters would you maybe use to try to um, group these patients? Um, you know, I don't know, like you're talking about the cardiometabolic versus the hypertensive phenotypes. Mm -hmm. um, would you look at, um, you know, RV, I mean, I guess, would you look at S prime? Would you look at TAPSI to see if there's any RV dysfunction? And that would be. Yeah, I, absolutely. So echo is incredibly useful. And, and, you know, I think we, we love to get human dynamics when we can, but we know that that's not feasible at all sites. And even those who have it, it can be often limited and patients don't always want to do that. Um, so echo is incredibly helpful. Um, we are increasingly using exercise diastolic stress testing. So it's a bike based test just to look at changes in LV filling pressures and also changes in RV metrics. So looking at changes in TAPSI and RV uh, fractional area change. Um, because one thing that is clear uh, over the last decade is that um, any study that has looked at predictors of outcomes has found that RV dysfunction and concomitant pulmonary hypertension are almost always guaranteed to be a predictor of badness. That's pretty much the same for any disease on the planet, but certainly is the case in half-pef. So I think having echo capacity to really 
well defined, you know, RV function is very helpful. Um, I think that's a patient you're gonna be more concerned about. That's a patient you're gonna have on your radar now for more aggressive, you know, just diuretic therapy and actually getting them on board with some of the guideline directed medical therapies and even cardio mems because those can be increasingly difficult patients to treat, um, especially if they're obese at the same time. So um, I think echo is very helpful there. We, you know, there are a number of um, kind of scoring algorithms and, 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 and two, two primary papers. So there's the H2PEF score from Barry Borlaug at Mayo Clinic, and then there's the ESC um, HFA PEF scoring algorithm. Both are designed for clinicians to then, you know, take a couple of simple clinical parameters that you're probably already getting and, and sort of calculate a score. And that score is, is designed to give you a, what's the risk of my patient having HFPEF? I think they're useful as an initial you know, cursory screen, but they're not perfect. So if you look at the performance of those two scores, and this has now been published in an obese HFPEF cohort with low anti-proBNP, those are exactly the patients that end up for both of those scoring algorithms right in that middle range, the gray zone, where the next step that both of those groups had published and suggested was more definitive testing. So I think that if, you know, if you're an astute clinician, you don't necessarily need those scoring algorithms to say, hey, something seems wrong. I'm suspecting HFPEF but I don't have that anti-proBNP that's, you know, over 300 to 500, and I don't have all the, you know, clear classic, um, uh, you know, checked off boxes for this. So maybe it's time for exercise, you know, diastolic testing or referring for right heart catheterization. Thank you. Sure. Well, um, it's four o'clock, so I know we're at the top of the hour and probably there are some folks uh, on the call who have other uh, meetings or activities to go to. So, um, well, Dr. Sharma, thank you so much again for taking the time and relatively short notice to set up this talk. Um, so very, very uh, happy that you made the time to join us. And um, uh, and uh, definitely, you know, just just a side note too, like the, you know, your amyloid paper has definitely changed, like, you know, my, my practice pattern where uh, after, you know, you published that a couple of years ago, I definitely um, have, try to advocate for, you know, looking for more amyloid uh, in HFPEF patients uh, when I see them in clinic and try to encourage others to do the same thing. So you're doing great work that's changing how we're taking care of people. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, Michael, uh, for uh, inviting me to come. And it's great to see you all and um, hope to see you all in person uh, in the next year or so at the meeting. So take care and thanks again. Bye-bye.